Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss J.M. Coetzee's article, Thinking Apartheid. In this article, we will try to understand what J.M. Coetzee is trying to talk about apartheid in this essay. So let's start. And if you haven't subscribed my YouTube channel, Success Matrix, kindly do that. So you will be getting all the updates of my uh, next lectures and if any comments you have, please post it. In this article, uh, Coetzee talks about how this, uh, the, his, the orthodoxy among historians of apartheid. When uh, in the history he's talking about that, when those who were the manufacturer of apartheid, when they thought of practicing apartheid and uh, when they thought of making it as a legalized system, uh, implementing through legislation, court and religion, what were the ideas they had in their mind? And the ideas were, uh, it was how the, uh, the, the uh, policies would be implemented. So the practice of segregation and furthermore that legislation okay so whatever the irrational ideas uh, they were there in the minds of the people who were actually thinking of implementing apartheid uh, this is what we are going to talk about this so initially Koizhi talks about the orthodoxy among historians of apartheid and how they made this concept of Afrikaner and the primal, primary idea of this was to make the white Africans uh, in the best privileged position. The idea uh, primarily, I mean, it has been uh, forcefully explained or uh, it, uh, the idea which was forcefully uh, conceptualized was one of the person who was known as Geoffrey Cronje. Geoffrey Cronje was South African professor of sociology at the University of Pretoria and one of the founder of the apartheid system in South Africa. The photo also is here, you can see that. Now, what were the ideas with Geoffrey uh, Cronje was trying to establish? So, if you see his career, he started as a, a professor in the university and then further he moved as and uh, the graduated from University of Stenbosch, 1929. Then he joined the, uh, like other nationalistically inclined young Afrikaner intellectuals of his generation. And he continued his study in German, Germany and Netherlands. And in, uh, later on, he uh, established himself as the professor. And... Uh, uh, there are some other scholars who were also influenced by uh, his contemporaries and they were influenced and they were of the uh, like-minded about apartheid. That was H.F. Verward, uh, Nick Derich and Pete Mayer. All of these were destined to powerful force of this uh, concept of Afrikaner and uh, how this is what they try to see. In 1948, Cronje uh, actually, I mean, the ideas which he established, because after that, in, after 1948, he uh, was not so frequently writing some of the writings he was writing. But uh, initially, before that, he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, four books. One was in 1945, another was in 46, then 47 and 48. And from uh, between 1945 to 48, he wrote four books. And what were these books? One was Home of Posterity, 1945. Second was Africa Without the Asiatic, 1946. Third was Just to Race, Apartheid, 1947. And fourth was Guardianship and Apartheid in 1948. These were the four books which were actually... Uh, formulating and reformulating the idea of apartheid and national party which was supported by the basic concept of Afrikaner. They heavily took ideas from these 
books and then finally they won election in 1948 and after that it was the concept of segregation started so how this idea of uh, segregation and apartheid started so and uh, kronje who jo joined political nazi party and uh, later on he helped the uh, be making the uh, afrikaner or the i mean that pan african i mean those uh, afrikaner is concept associated with the africans who white africans those whites who were residing in africa and primarily they were in minority so these afrikaners they were how to make their uh, political social economic and religious benefits for the uh, whites and uh, later on in after 1948 he was writing about the plights of landless poor whites and uh, he was trying to think about the uh, boom of the war time economy uh, which is regarding related to the migrations of the uh, afrikaners i mean those whites africans who were uh, migrating but he's actually the the idea which he's conceptualizing is related to the uh, exploitation of black body or uh, using black a uh, blacks edge as their for their labor primarily so uh, the same thing we can uh, understand in indian concept when we talk about caste system caste system is also as dr ambedkar said it's a four story building and in which the, uh, the all the division of the caste is also based on the resources so privileged communities they have maximum resources they have maximum access to all kind of facilities and uh, progress and growth and deprived and uh, dalits they are uh, they are out of resources and this is how the uh, the same thing which we can associate with madness of manu how manu is justifying caste system and uh, how this madness i mean you know it is irrational but because it is supporting some of the minorities who are privileged and they want to maintain their privileges so this madness of history the justification of caste system and race is maintained through even historians so apartheid uh, as koji talks about apartheid proves madness of history because you know the points which are being given justification for the uh, apartheid and the segregation uh, separated society it is actually the concept is illogical it is irrational but it has been justified uh, uh, endlessly and that is how the main thing is use of the black body as a labor so capitalist found it it sane and found it interest in it while liberals who diagnosed apartheid as a form of hubris hubris is a i mean it is known as hackery uh, or uh, akad jisko bolte hain and madness by denouncing it as such dispense denses from it but ultimately in this re, uh, re, reading attempting little more than uh, the district attention from their continuing material complicity in exploitation of the black lab, uh, uh, black labor so uh, the capitalist who are uh, uh, who are getting the benefits of this apartheid and uh, they are not rejecting this idea of irrationality of the history and the justification of using black bodies as a labor because through the use of the black bodies as a labor they can actually make their uh, business grow up and they can sustain their economy and uh, their growth so when we call that apartheid is a madness i mean it is one of the uh, i mean uh, insane uh, minds understanding of the history where the idea is 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 exactly uh, dehumanizing humans and the idea is just using the resources of poor and landless and and helpless people but still it is being supported because it help the liberal capital, capitalist and the liberal capitalist also they 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 supported segregation so in this way when we say self interest do not have to be same thing 
the logic that takes apartheid to be sane because rational rational because governed by self interest deserve to be questioned so when we talk about that uh, the logic which is being given although the idea of apartheid is insane it is irrational but it is being still supported because it served the self interest of those few those white those afrikaners and those capitalist of africa and uh, this is what the same thing we can see in india where the caste because uh, the shudras and untouchables are also you being used for their labor physical labor so although they are not being given equal rights equal uh, humanitarian uh, uh, status and uh, they are not being protected as a human being even as ambedkar talks but their labor is being used by so called upper caste and this madness of caste system as we can correlate it with this race that uh, when we talk about brahman kshatriya vaishya shudra and dalit or untouchables it is same as as if these three so called upper varnas brahman kshatriya vaishya they are utilizing the resource and the labor of shudras and untouchables and this is how and that's how to justify uh, this a caste system there were number of uh, bans and restrictions were put on the uh, on these communities for example you could see the picture where uh, untouchables were not allowed to wear even proper clothes so the male could only cover their lower part of the body and women and they have to tie broom in the back of uh, back side of their waist uh, uh, and uh, they have to tie a ardan cord in their neck so if a when a untouchable is walking uh, his footsteps must be removed and uh, if he has to spit because if he is walking on the road and if he is spitting on the road it could uh, pollute and in the other picture you could see that a woman is cleaning latrine or oh, no she is she is picking excreta and uh, this is how the caste system is also using the labor of untouchables lower communities so called lower communities and race is also using the black bodies as a uh, labor so apartheid justifies the doctrine on the ground that it was the long term interest of the whites the the theorist of apartheid justifies the doctrine on the ground that it was a long term interest of whites apartheid demanded sacrifice they said but in the long term such sacrifices would pay off because when this concept was implemented and it was uh, proved by the legislation and law it was very difficult actually to justify how to segregate i mean putting white population in a separate uh, residential area and segregating uh, blacks then division in the education where this uh, i mean this uh, unlawful uh bantu act was implemented in 1953 where a special syllabus was uh, applied for the implemented for the blacks and uh, the the schools their education system uh, most of the things were destroyed so uh, they could be uh, i mean uh, they could be uh, they could be the blacks could be uh, the, the the blacks would be the, the growing as a unskilled laborers and most of the time they would not be able to rise to the higher level so that is why and um, and some people explain it as a as that um, uh, this uh, apartheid is a it is it is it is it is the insane uh, Uh, insane thinking of a mind, or it is an act of a demon. So when we say, uh, Jim Coyzi says that pinning the blame for apartheid on demon is uh, is realizing pinning it nowhere. I mean, if we have to understand the concept and the problem, then simply saying it as it is an act of demon, uh, it is somewhere we are not actually fixing the problem anywhere. So that's how we have to say that it is a it is a question of history. it is a question of a social science it's a question of uh, this uh, this human life and that is why then um, coetzee is talking about illegal bantu and that's how 
the justification of caste and these are the sudden clarity given by Koizhi. Koizhi says that why people are were in favor of caste or race because those who are so called upper caste when they maintain their caste status it gives them a, a status I mean you know it gives them a sense of being uh, somewhere more pure and it create it gives them a status a community it gives them hope to maintain their resources and it gives them self-respect and all these four things caste I mean the status of the community hope self-respect and uh, this, uh, this sense of community. It is being denied to the uh, lower communities, so-called lower communities. So in uh, this, it is very significant for right now to talk about this illegal Bantu Act, 1953. And this Bantu Education Act, which was later on uh, known as the, uh, the Black Education Act of 1953, was a South African segregation law that legislated for several aspects of apartheid system. Its major provisions enforce racially separated educational facilities. And that's how we say it's a Bantu Education Act 1953. Now this in Bantu Education Act 1953, later it was renamed as the Black Education Act 1953 was a South African segregation law that legislated for several aspects of that party system. Its major provisions were enforced uh, racially separated education policies, even universities were made tribal, and but all three mis missionary schools closed to down when the government would no longer help to support their schools. Very few authorities continued using their own uh, finances to support education for Native Africans. In 1959, that type of education was extended to non-white universities and colleges and extension of the University Act and Universities College of, uh, of Fort Hare was taken over by the government and degraded to being part of Bantu education system. There are a number of other things are also associated with the Bantu Education Act where a teacher taught ratio was uh, extremely disturbed. I mean, number of students were increased beyond the capacity of managing one teacher. So maybe, uh, earlier, the ratio would have been 60 uh, students and one teacher. Now, it has gone more than 200 students and one teacher. The basic facilities of the schools were taken out. There was no institution or no private and public institutions who were supporting or taking care of the resources of the schools. No proper syllabus was also there. And uh, even if the, the simplest of the things, school buildings were also not maintained properly maintained. So this, it is often argued that the policy of Bantu or African education was aimed to direct black or non-white youth to unskilled labor market. Although Hendrik Warward, the minister of native affairs claimed that the aim was to solve South Africa's ethnic problem by creating complementary economic and political uh, units uh, for uh, different ethnic groups. Uh, this is actually, uh, it's, it's the shifting the problem. So uh, the primary concern of the Bantu Act was to make non-white youth to, to as the unskilled labor, laborer for the market. But how it was uh, spoken or how it was polished that uh, the, the government was trying to pro, uh, solve the problem of, of ethnicity in Africa. Uh, actually, there was no problem like that. So uh, this uh, education... Uh, which is a pivotal or a key to any uh, of the society for the growth of the any society. This Bantu Act of South Africa 1953 actually clearly destroyed everything uh, or it destroyed the hope of the uh, black children uh, and they would not be um, uh, educated properly. And this is how we call it a act of a architect of apartheid state. So, apartheid demanded black bodies in all their physicality in order to burn up their energy as labor. Uh, as an episode in historical time, apartheid was casually overdetermined. It did indeed flower out of self-interest and greed. So, the primary goal of this, I mean, we have to understand the primary goal of those, uh, those, uh, those, those 
minds who were creating this concept implementing this concept was the demanded black bodies and all their physicality in order to burn up their energy as a labor so they wanted the complete african blacks as a labor for the market and the industry were owned by white minority africans and uh, the labor was supplied by the majority of the black africans so that's how this is what the uh, real purpose of this apartheid but to justify it number of other polished terms and vocabularies and other confusions were created in the history so that's why its essence from the beginning was confusion and confusion is displaced widely all around itself so who will tell that uh, what an apartheid was difficult to know but if we get honest confession then we might know and this is what of one of the most significant statement koji is saying he says that if you try to find out the answer in the history that why this apartheid was implemented and what were the concept and all other things uh, it we would not find anywhere until and unless people actually come and they confess those who were implementing those who were uh, drafting the uh, this crafty law uh, until and unless they come and they do honest confession that okay this was the main purpose in our mind and that's how we uh, we manufactured this law uh then only we can find out the honest answer otherwise it is complete confusion and this madness will never be revealed so churchman called apartheid as sin not because it was a crime of huge dimension the notion of the crime as an inbuilt weakness crimes are defined by the victors and apartheid was not a victor but it because it sets for it set the task of reforming that is to say in fact it was given as a task of reforming the african community but that was not it was making the african community unskilled so they could be a uh, raw material for the market or the labor so deforming and hardening the human heart about that will remain a mystery as long as it is not approach in the layer of the heart if we want to understand it we cannot ignore those uh, passages of its testament that reach the heart speech of autobiography and confusion and confession it was set as a task of reforming it did uh, deforming and hardening the human heart so what uh, cronje writes it is in the spirit that i approach the writing of geoffrey cronje i treat them as a confession not as a repentant confessioner for it but as a confession of belief so uh, koji says that if you read the history if you read the text of books of written by cronje then you would find that uh, we have to take these writings as confession because that's how he is actually laying the the diagram or the boundary for apartheid and how to understand apartheid that's very simple apartheid will remain a mystery as long as it is not approached in the air of heart if we want to understand it we cannot ignore those passages of those testaments that reach us in the heart speech of autobiography and confession so if you have to understand what is apartheid how it started let us talk let us see the confession those who laid down this outline so apartheid is a dream of purity and uh, uh, but it's an impure dream and this is how uh, even if this concept is associated with the colonialism uh, with the caste system with the gender and the race as well so how this notion of purity in pollution in the indian caste system also you will find that uh, some of the caste are considered to be pure and some of the caste are uh, considered to be impure and geoffrey cronje as in, in the, and his fellow knights of apartheid the baffling force that must be thwarted impressions shut away apartheid is a dream of purity but an impure dream it is many things a mixture of things one of things it is set of uh, barriers that will uh, make it impossible for the desire to mix to find fulfillment my concern is thus less with geoffrey cronje himself a man of not great historical importance than with his madness and with the question of how madness spread itself or is uh, this meant to spread through a social body more generally with the reinsertion 
of madness in, into history. You know, this madness was accepted, spread, and written by all because they were the beneficiary. They were the beneficiaries. Those who were spreading this madness, sustaining this madness, justifying this madness of apartheid. Madness of apartheid means justifying this impure dream in a purest way. So, because they were the beneficiaries, and here same way we find notion of purity and pollution associated with the caste system. So, some of the caste they are considered to be very pure as Brahmin and so-called upper caste, and the work of a sweeper is considered to be impure and uh, related to the pollution and that's how the hierarchy is also there uh, there is a ladder or there is a hierarchy there is a pyramid which in which caste system is uh, on the top brahman kshatriya and uh, the extreme top is brahmin then kshatriya then vaishya and shudras and untouchables are in the lower and so the economy and their uh, condition is there so this is purity and pollution is inbuilt and you can find out the concept of purity pollution and inherited occupational role inability to restrict ability to uh, alter inherited status i mean in caste system also it is birth based blood as dr ambedkar called is birth based blood you can't change your caste because you are been born with the parents who are so called lower caste even if an upper caste or so called upper caste also can't their she can't change their caste because they are also born in the high caste so this social structure the high formal order of cleanliness and control and protective uh, order of hygiene and uh, this is social order which is associated with the purity and pollution is low born are considered to be disordered diseased infectious and polluted and that's how the same thing we can see here the Uh, brahmin is considered to be the topmost and high and pure and untouchables are lowest so uh, these are some of the terms which are being used by koetzi uh, and what he says i mean in this whole article there are number of uh, concepts and terminologies which are being used which we need to understand which is very very significant that blackness is equal to infectiousness blackness is associated with infectiousness if there is any impurity pollution and infection is there which is associated with the blackness so public health sanitization finally is also associated with the black if it is unhygienic unclean dirty that is associated with the black and controlling economy uh, so the economic uh, control and benefits are going to the so called upper caste and the privileged whites and the labor part comes to the uh lower communities and blacks so blackness is low hygiene black women servants and unclean uh, uncleanliness outcast uh, territory out of border out of community out of city and out of economy the way sweepers are still not uh, respected minority whites are giving their clothes to the whites by blacks but as the blacks are residing in a chukki uh, basti kind of thing unclean area so that's why there is a very many possibility of getting the clothes infected with dirt of the whites so the way indian untouchables minority poor and other transgenders uh, are uh, treated in this they, they live in poor locality they live in under privilege unhygienic conditions and that's how um, maniard uh, swanson says it is a sanitization syndrome or black contamination so caste and race gives the benefactors lot of social political economic and religious privileges apartheid historically apartheid is related to legislation uh, it can only become law when it comes to the legislation so apartheid culture segregation afrikaner concept of blood blood purity and this this is very significant actually this is being elaborated by swanson and what is this blood purity blood purity means a white woman can only have physical relations with the white man and that's how she has to maintain her blood purity so uh, there was a restriction clear restriction on the white woman to can she can only marry and have relationship with the white man and there is no such possibility of extramarital affair or cross breeding nothing possible 
but the same thing was not so much uh, hardened for the uh, white man who who are interested in the black woman uh, physical relation so that's how uh, lee bond swanson black body become only labor for the generators uh, if black essence or black culture black semen black woman and i mean these are all uh, these are all black culture a black semen black woman and those black women if uh, if a white man is having a, a close contact with a woman then she he could be infected uh, because a black woman's body is unclean dirty so black race is uh, infected and sanitized uh, the syndrome of blackness infectiousness uh, epido ep epidemic or uh, it is i mean you know they related to the public health sanitization and that's how the and ultimately the goal is uh, using controlling black body only for the labor so that's how uh, swanson uh, talks about this so that's how the imagination of african are massive by giving them meaning community status hope and self respect that we have already talked about so because uh, this maintaining this minority status or afrikaner uh, concept or the upper caste notion or uh, i mean uh, the patriarchal uh, uh, notion it actually make or give them uh, the clear me me uh, meaning the community the status the whole hope and the self respect because this self respect is not associated with the women uh, with the so called untouchables uh, blacks and other colored communities so ng rudy uh, this ng rudy is after uh, cronje and he is actually trying to elaborate the ideas of cronje and he gives an idea of how he was seen at that time by the establishment of social science community during the years of ferment after the world war uh, rights rudy cronje attempting to bring about sociological responsible evolution and diagnosis the south african race problematic the uh, scientific uh, rigor of this policy proposal to be commanded his book of this period taken together constitute the first comprehensive argu principle exposition system of ethnic relation uh, uh, after 1948 would crystallize as apartheid a numerous policy direction that cronje suggested today the government with blend of academic formality and crudeness reminiscence of cronje himself rudy identifies as arguably cronje greatest contribution inside that the key to bunto problematic is the physical presence of black with white south african and after that there was a complete physical drainage away complete segregation even the uh, residential localities were separated and all institutions workplace residence even the market market places were also uh, separated the doctrine of a unique afrikaner and what is this uniqueness about the afrikaner in retrospect we can see that in elaborating the doctrine of a unique afrikaner a uh, charge with the historical duty of maintaining its own and uniqueness cronje as in followers behaved much like nationalist intellectuals worldwide it was not that nationalistic fervor but the step by uh, they were prepared to take uh, to realize their dreams that set them apart born in more than one sense on the periphery of mumbai young educated ambitious africans speaking man like ronje in decades after the anglo boer war 1899 to 1902 had found only a few avenues of advancement open to the law the church teaching and the uh, level of all bureaucracies uh, tom nairns is said about forming the tom and nines were a militant interclass community rendered strongly if mythically aware of its own uh, separate identity vis-a-vis the outside force of domination they work with only materials at hand the people and peculiarities of the reason it inherited ethos speech folklore skin color and so nationalists to work through the difference state like those because as uh, talking as their constituencies the rural rural poor and impoverished urban uh, afrikaners they built out of the afrikaner uh, box so the blood purity 
the notion of purity and pollution with the caste, race, gender, Afrikaner mother, Afrikaner family, Afrikaner blood, Afrikaner farm. I mean, uh, if Afrikaner mother, a white mothers, they raise their children in a different way. Afrikaner families, those white minorities, do, do they have their family in a very beautiful, very nice family, ideal family. Afrikaner blood is pure blood. It is. Uh, it should not be contaminated by the impure blood of the blacks. And Afrikaner farms are also different. So Cronje in his first book, 1945, dedicated to the author's wife and other Afrikaner mother, protectors of the blood purity. And that's how he's setting instructions for the woman that a white woman can only have physical relation with the white man only. And she has to make the race, uh, uh, you know, pure. So that's how the purity of the blood. That should not be a mixing of the blood, mixing of the blood, uh, black versus white. So finally, uh, we say thank you and kindly subscribe my channel, Success Matrix. And this is the article we were talking about, Apartheid Thinking, written by J.M. Coitz.